Hey, good morning, everybody. I'm Ryan with Propelio. Today is Monday, and we are back at it. Uh, it's been two weeks. I hope you had a great holidays with Christmas and the New Year, uh, but it's back, back to that grind. Uh, today, Daniel and I, we're going to be talking about market cycles, regentrification, um, and, you know, it's Daniel came up with a great tagline. He was talking about, ever met somebody who accidentally made a couple hundred do thousand dollars? So stick around. Um, make sure you like, share, subscribe, all those things. We're on YouTube. We're on podcast land. We're on Facebook. Uh, looking forward to it. Make sure you jump in the comments. Let us know you're, where you're watching from, what you think. And if you're watching on replay, uh, be, feel free to ask those questions. So looking forward to it. Stick around. <laughs> What up, everybody? Good morning, man. It's been weeks, like weeks, weeks, because like besides just the Christmas holidays, right before that, we had that marketing summit, and then yeah. right before that, we had the New Orleans EXP thing going on, so it's been almost like two months, it feels well, like. Well, you know, the holidays, it always seems like it's just, because I know you got on to me last week about doing something not TV related, but expansion for thing. I'm like, bro, it's the holiday. I mean, what do you want me to do? You're like, oh, yeah, I forgot. I'm just... It's been a wild couple months, man. We just, just, just tired, just tired. That's all I can say, man. It's just been nonstop go, <laughs> well, go, you don't go, look go, it. go. <laughs> so, man, so I guess the topic for today is, you know, I don't know about you, but if you network long enough in the real estate investing industry, you'll find somebody, or if you're just talking at like your, yeah. your dinner, like, yeah, I, I, I bought my house and you know, when I sold it, I made $100,000 or, you know, you hear stories quite often of people that, make ridiculous amounts of money without even planning to do so. It was more of a surprise than a plan. Yeah, and, and I'll throw in there, obviously in the real estate world, there's always elements of bending factual information, but let's just take it at face value that the hundreds of thousands of dollars they claim we're just going to say, yeah, they, they made that. We'll just take that off the board. Well, besides just believing what they say, the basis behind it is very not only probable but accurate because it right. happens quite often. And what that boils down to is, A, market cycles, understanding mm -hmm. market cycles, and B, uh, gentrification. You know, you, don't, you could be in a different market cycle than an upward trending cycle and still make a considerable amount of money accidentally in real estate through gentrification. And for those that may not understand what gentrification is, I mean, essentially it's taking a low income neighborhood and that low income neighborhood over a period of time transitioning to, um, a higher, more affluent neighborhood just due to several different things. It could be social, it could be political, it could be just economics in general. You know, maybe Ikea comes in, like we've got mm -hmm. this area right over here in Grand Prairie where Ikea buys up this plot of land and now all of a sudden there's a big resource for jobs, there's a big magnet of, of an economic epicenter and now there's other things that are going to build around it and as everything around that builds, all the property values around it go up with it. Yeah, and you, you hear about that all the time, like, mm -hmm. hey, a new train route has come through or hey, uh, the the loop is going through here and and it is a lot of people get lucky by it and and, and I, hopefully that's what we're going to talk about and that's what we're talking about today a gentrification b uh market cycles because both of them play drastically into accidentally making a massive amount of money because i mean honestly um i guess market cycles and gentrification would almost play into each other because that's like a micro uh, gentrification or micro market cycle because you end up taking like George Bush Tollway. Whenever that finally mm -hmm. went from 35 on down and connected to 30, everything in its pathway just boomed. Right. If you can look into the into the future and predict what's going to happen in that area, and it doesn't take a whole lot of rocket science to predict that. I mean, if you're part of the planning and zoning and you're paying attention to what your what your government's doing, they're going to be telling you what they're trying to do. We're going to start putting money into this area. We're going to start, you know, we're going to build a highway from here to there. Well, if you know that they're planning on building a highway from here to there, there is a lot of opportunity to get ahead of that curve and not be one of the accidental people that won. And I'll even discuss some opportunities that might be able to be played into effect that will allow you to take advantage of that without expending a considerable amount of money. So so for, for those that are listening to the podcast or watching on a replay, um, 
here's a little bit of homework. Push pause. And what I want you to do is, is write down some examples of those accidental situations in your own market. Mm -hmm. um, if you're watching live, start dropping them in the comments. Uh, or even if you're watching a replay, drop in the comments. Love to hear what y you think is an accidental or just different examples so the community can share and build off the different ideas. Because, I mean, the AT&T Stadium, a big stadium project, mm -hmm. that's an accidental You've told potential. me stories of a, this guy wasn't doing it by accident. You told me I got a guy that knew that the stadium was going in. Preemptively, he purchased a plot of commercial mm -hmm. land. And if I remember correctly, I think it was you that told me about this. Like, he held on to it until the stadium was built, and then he sold it for, like, $10 million more than he paid for it. And then on the flip side, there's mm -hmm. all those people that keep on, and again, Dallas-centric, that keep on buying Fair Park property right. because the next big thing, and guess what? It still hasn't come. Well, to, to, to their credit, if we bought Fair Park four years ago, there's been a 400% increase in value there. Fair Park four to five years ago was ten to $12,000 a house. Mm -hmm. uh, because, but, like, I know, like, and again, not to get nitty gritty, but like eight years ago, lots were like $500 in that land area. For, for, for me, gentrification on a, depending upon the driving factor for it, is a long process. Like whenever I first started in real estate, I was 23 years old and I bought in Old East, mm -hmm. right over there off of uh, Peak and Haskell. Everything we're gonna be talking about is Dallas because that's where we invest. But Peak and Haskell, just north of there was Old East. It was mm -hmm. kind of a barrio, um, but it was seeing massive amounts of new construction going in. Well, you go over there today and about 50 to 60 percent of it has been rebuilt and you know revitalized but you're still seeing you know half million dollar condos sitting right next to what's now two hundred thousand dollar shacks because right. that shack is just worth so much more because of the house next to it but it's still a shack uh, i.e where i live yeah. where well those shacks are now four hundred thousand but it's lot value right um but again going tying it back into the topic of the accidental um, uh, um, accidental profit <laughs> yeah. is it, it just and I've talked about on the show, but a quick recap is in my neighborhood. We're, I mean, it's if you look at a map, it's so obvious that eventually it would gentrify. Um, but there was a big building, they tore it down, and then they were going to build basically east west village, uptown type okay. ass thing. And then boom, just kidding, we're going to build a Sam's Club. <laughs> That's so totally at different. that point in time, like all development in the area stopped because nobody wants to live next to a Sam's Club. But then the local uh, 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 neighborhood, they took them to court and had been sitting in court for like three or four years. And then I think mid last year, boom, the court decided, no, you're not allowed to build a big box thing. And then immediately, boom. immediately houses went from being sold for a hundred thousand for lot value. And then just boom, da boom, da boom. And now they're in the four to 500,000. And what they're doing is tearing them down and building uh, duplexes on each plot of land. And they're going from 600 to 1.2 million each for a half duplex for a half duplex. Yeah. So, so again, tying it back, that's planned, but at the same time, but if how you many were before that and go, yeah. there's no way they're going to build a Sam's How Club. many of those people bought there 10 years ago with no clue that that was going to happen? And then they moved it's through and now all of a sudden they bought a house for sixty to $70,000 and right now it's sitting at a $400,000 lot value. Right. So let's talk about how you can, you know, take an educated move to start making that play into your favor. Instead of being the one that accidentally made the hundreds of thousands of dollars, being the one that planned to make millions and millions. So let's look at some factors that might be able to play into a neighborhood doing something like that. And you mentioned through that little case study of your own back, backyard is there was a driving influence that pushed the economy in that neighborhood. And that was they were going to build some sort of economic epicenter. So that, mm -hmm. I would say that is one of the driving factors of gentrification mm -hmm. is a new economic epicenter being put into a neighborhood that's going to attract a different clientele. And, and, and just to throw this caveat into the, to this personal uh, um, uh, case study, in 2011, I was held at gunpoint <laughs> 57 feet from my front door. Right. So just to let you know. It's a rougher neighborhood. It's a barrio. Yeah. Where it was. It's, it's, a, in it's the, a transitioning yeah. barrio. Um, and I, I would expect that transition to last another 10 years. It's not going to just, you know, there are some things that drive it and cause it to just boom within, mm -hmm. you know, a few years. But in this particular scenario, I would expect 10 to 15 years before that, that really stabilizes and turns. Mm -hmm. um, like looking at Old East, it's been 10 years and it's just now getting to the point that it's really kind of semi changed. Right. Um, but so an economic factor like that. So where would we find out what the plans for that are? Well, you know, I have no clue, but it seems like 
and again, planning just, and zoning. Planning and zoning, but mm -hmm. it seems like social media is always kind of like the buzz, but obviously, so you're, you're trying probably to, finding it after the fact, yeah, unless yeah, you're yeah, following you, you, you're like your city council. Well, that's or what I was trying like to that. go with it is the social media would be the accidental slash, <laughs> it, you know, if you're trying to correlate, not correlate, but if you're trying to tie it in back into like stock market, by the time you're trading right. on the news, you've already lost the, the, the upswing lost, or yep. the downswing. If, if the news is talking about it, you lost the party. Yeah. You know, by so. Like if you're attending your Dallas City Council meetings or your council meetings, your planning and zoning meetings, if you're attending those, you're talking to zoning, things like the, the George Bush Tollway that goes through the north side of town, that was discussed for a decade. Mm -hmm. And if you were paying attention to that and you were entering into the early parts of those discussions and you're going to see, okay, they're planning on connecting 35 to 30 across the northernmost part of the Metroplex, what is that path going to be and how am I going to be able to take advantage of it? Well, I know if I've got like, you know, further south, I got 635, I got Jupiter, I got all those things and those are running north. Right. Well, if those are running north, where is that going to intersect with George Bush? And if I can grab that, I'm on the right path. So, so Trey, I think that's your first nugget for, for the morning. Um, there you go, Trey, um, <laughs> is, you know, take time to go to your local city council meetings. I think in the world, and I just, I think I discovered this uh, in December when we went to that digital marketing conference, that in the world of, of real estate investing, at least from my point of view, it gets very myopic. You're always only focused on real estate investor events. You're only focused on uh, uh, inter or not interviewing, uh, um, um, networking inside with, of your community, in, inside of your community. And there's so and, and I can't imagine how boring a city council meeting is. <laughs> but imagine the people that I you think can, Travion can tell us. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, Travion used to to do the digital filming of the uh, one of the local city councils. But imagine the people you can network, the politicians. But just the you, the you know, network you can pull the out of the network that. you can pull out. But just the information you can pull out of it. And I'm not saying every single meeting you're going to get something. Mm -hmm. But if there ever is going to be one of those bombs. It's going to be first laid there. I mean, they could literally be sitting there and then you hear somebody show up because everybody gets an opportunity to speak to the council. Somebody can come in and be like, you really need to clean up my street. There's four abandoned properties on my street and there's all, yeah, boom. Well, what? you just, what? yeah, what? I mean, what? there's, there's four opportunity abandoned to pop up. Taking properties? Like, hell. And so, like, that is great. And another opportunity, like you start talking about since we did run off topic, or not even running off topic, but to run off topic is network at like your doctor meetups, your dentist meetups, mm -hmm. your, your high-end, high-dollar professional meetups, because you go to those types of things, you're not a dentist or a doctor, but if you want to find private money, start mingling with those people, because well, they're all interested in real estate, they just don't have the time to do again, it. But again, but that does tie it back in, because mm -hmm. within the medical community, they're probably first to learn that, oh, by the way, that, that hospital over there in, in East whateverville, mm -hmm. It's actually about to add a giant wing for blah, 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 blah. Take Medical City here in Dallas. Right. For the longest time, it was just, you know, a little area of hospitals. And then they did this massive growth phase where now Maple, Mockingbird, that it whole area by Dallas Love Field is all brand new construction. I mean, the hospital's been under construction for, for years now. But because it's a teaching hospital, you have high-end condos, high-end everything in that little pocket that frankly, I didn't, wasn't a fan of driving on that neighborhood just because you might get shot. It's, it's, it was rough over there and it's definitely transitioned and changed considerably. And it's, but, but the point being is, how would you know about that other than seeing a, a construction, something, construction coming, <laughs> but if you went to a meeting like that, they'd probably be talking about it. So there's all types of ways of getting ahead of the curve on this. Another one that a good friend of mine, Marquise, was bringing up, like Diamond Hill in the north side of Fort Worth, historically been a high crime area, low income, high crime area. There's a lot of things if you're just driving through Diamond Hill that you're going to start seeing has changed in the last several years. They're building a really nice train station over there where they're bringing in a you know, public transportation train station. Uh, they're redoing the streets. They're expanding the streets. Mm -hmm. They're bringing in, and now all of a sudden on the fringes of Diamond Hill, which is where it's going to start, we're starting to see really nice high-end loft-style condos going in right off of the Trinity River. There's a lot of infrastructure going in. The patrolling of the police has escalated considerably so there's a political movement uh, essentially mm -hmm. what we're seeing to clean that area up and if that area is being cleaned up it's going to attract a higher clientele and as that higher clientele goes in this goes into some of the 
how would you say that? Some of the negative connotations that are attached to gentrification. And that's going to be the established communities, the people that have lived there for 50 years, they can't afford to live somewhere else, are essentially going to, through the process of gentrification, be forced to move from there. Because if you've yeah. got somebody living on a fixed income, they bought their house and they've owned it free and clear for 20 years and they plan on retiring and passing away in that home, they can no longer afford the taxes. Yeah, especially here in Texas, because this is a, a fight that my, my best friend and I have all the time, because he's from Alabama, and every any chance you can get him to talk about Tyler, <laughs> you can get him to talk about taxes, he just loses it for about 30 minutes. <laughs> especially this past week, when yeah, he was on his checkbook, just boom, boom, boom. Right. But, you know, yeah, that's, that's a huge thing, is gentrification here in Texas, where, you know, you've been living the same house 50 years, boom, uh, at and stadiums around the corner, or boom, a brand new hot, or whatever the uh, examples go, mm -hmm. and guess what? Your taxes just increased by 30%, 50%, whatever. And they can't afford it. So right. anybody that believes they own their house is is just waiting for Uncle Sam to knock on the door and say, where's my taxes? Because nobody owns their <laughs> not house. Not to get political. Not, it's, it's not political, it's just honesty. I yeah. mean, there's no, if, you're, if, you're, if you fail to write a check to your local government for your property taxes, wait until you see how long it takes before they take it from you. You're paying rent on your house. Right. So, so these people that have a fixed income of, let's say, Social Security at 800 bucks a month, and they're used to paying you know 1,200 bucks a year in taxes, then that's something that they can budget for and afford. But whenever their house value goes from 70,000, like in your neighborhood to now 400,000, they can no longer afford right. that and they're forced to move. They're not, they're not wanting to move, they're forced to move. So there's some negative connotations pulled into that. Uh, so if you're just tuning in, what we're talking about today is market cycles, regentrification, and how to effectively plan for those accidental growths. Like uh, we were talking about like uh, something coming in that just dramatically changes the market in that little area, say a stadium, a freeway, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we did drop a couple of hints before, so I recommend if you're just tuning in to, to come back later or rewatch the earlier part. Uh, but just to get back into it. Well, let's do some technical sides of yes, this. Yes, please. Um, so I'm going to give you, so we've talked about, you know, going into your planning and zoning, your city council, and that right there will give you a really large preemptive move on it. Uh, remember, I had that deal that I was trying to push forward last year with John yeah. Lau. Yeah. Dude was worth a quarter billion dollars. and Was worth a quarter billion dollars. I'll throw that out there. Uh, <laughs> Quarter billion dollars, this guy had a massive empire built and he did it all through what we just discussed. Seeing where the economy was going, planning ahead of it, purchasing purchasing land, he was a land broker, purchasing land in the path of development and then selling it for four X in a year. Mm -hmm. And part of that was understanding zoning and understanding what was going on there. He, he mentioned something when I was discussing with him about a little area northeast of, of, of the DFW Metroplex where the uh, core or the ag, uh, the core of engineers were planning on building a lake because DFW is starved for fresh water right now. So they needed a new lake and they've been talking about building it there for close to 10 years. Well, the city council finally put the stamp on it. Well, when they put the stamp on it, that 100 to 200 acres surrounding it is all mm -hmm. of a sudden going to come water and boom, you've got opportunities to buy it low, sell it high. And that was the stuff he's talking and, about. And a, another nugget from that whole interaction that uh, also Dan Diaz from San Antonio, he, he had his own take on it as well, is, uh, I forgot what the quote, but it was basically the number of people playing in that pond, uh, no pun intended, but <laughs> the, the, the amount of people playing in that field are so, there's zero competition. Mm -hmm. Like, whereas a, a wholesale deal, apartment listing, a commercial deal, you know, obviously the funnel of, of competition goes down, but that type of game, you gotta learn you, there's like, what, two people in North Texas that have the, the power or the network to pull something that off? Mm -hmm. So if you can go in there, go when, for it. Whenever and I was talking it, to John, he said there were about five to six players in DFW that could do a deal like that. And, and what I was, the reason I brought Dan Diaz, because he, he was in here last year, and, he, and his whole topic was fish where nobody's fishing. Right. Again, a pond. Right. Uh, but, you know, and then that's basically the same thing, is, is do something that somebody else is not doing yet. So let me give you another little nugget. Um, if you have access to exporting um, property data, there is a tool called Batch Geo, B-A-T-C-H-G-E-O. And one of the cool things you can do with Batch Geo is you can, um, you can map data. So if I have a data that's corresponding to a geographical location, I can map that data and I can then create heat maps 
I can create um, you know, multicolored pins. I can do quite a bit of different tools with Batch Geo. So if I can export real estate data and I can start saying, you know what, show me all of the properties for in 2012 and what their property values were or their days on market. You know, I can, I can heat map by different numbers. Let's mm. say I go first by sell price and I map 2014 and then I create another map for 2015, 16, 17, 18. Mm -hmm. What I can do is I can load that map and then I can cycle between the years. So if I'm looking at the heat map and I'm seeing a real heavy red area up here of high sold values, well, what I can do is I can say 2012 and then I hit 13. And what I'll do is I'll see that map shift a little bit. And what you might be surprised to see, and this is very interesting in my opinion, like if we go back in DFW here, 18 to 20 years, M Streets was nothing. Oh, yeah. M Streets was $80,000 duplexes built in the 1920s that were run down nothings. If we look here at the Magnolia uh, area of Fort Worth, that was East Rosedale. That was not a good area to be in. But in just the last 10 years, Magnolia has seen a massive transition. Well, if I take a look at Batch Geo and I'm pumping this data in there, what you're going to start seeing is I saw 2008 and then I hit 2009. I'm going to start seeing an area turn orange. 2010, it gets red. 2011, everything else around it gets orange, orange. And if I can start looking at a map and I can start saying, okay, here's what the data is telling me. This area is booming and it's pushing east. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, if it's pushing east, if I am looking to get into the path of a strong market cycle and I can see viable reasons for that market cycle to continue pushing in this area, I'll get slightly ahead of the curve and I'll start employing some, some real estate st st uh, strategies that will allow me to acquire massive amounts of property with limited funds. And, and that's one thing that I would like to challenge everybody uh, that's watching investor uh, wise for 2019, because I know in my personal uh, real estate investing career, um, the teams I've been a part of, you know, we didn't really think like that. Mm -hmm. you, you, it was very reactive. It was, yes, you were very proactive on, on, on what list you're pulling to network to, whether it be direct mail or, or where you're dropping your bonnet, bandit signs. But in terms of forward thinking of, okay, in six to eight months, this area over here is going to be the, the it market. So I need to be in there to capitalize on those, uh, that appreciation and, and have more of a speculative approach. You know, the heat mapping and like, other than you, because I know we did something uh, last year that uh, about marketing mm -hmm. and using heat maps for for uh, locate not location for the driving patterns. Okay. Like I had never even thought about using heat mapping like that, and in fact, I've never used heat mapping at all. So, do you mind if we take a two minute detour to talk about heat mapping and the benefits of that, or is that getting way off topic? The only the only thing I'm going to mention on the heat mapping side is it is a way to quickly visualize massive amounts of data. Mm. So if I'm looking at all of the home sold prices for a metropolitan area for the course of a year, massive amounts of data. The easiest way for me to consume that is apply it to a heat map and allow myself to see what an area is doing. Uh, other 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 things that I could throw onto that heat map outside of just the sold price could be days on market. You know, if I'm seeing days on market contract significantly in an area, it might tell me that there's a demand pushing in that area. Mm -hmm. Like if we were looking at the transition from 2008 to 2009, you know, days on market were just dr or skyrocketing. The demand was dropping. But as we started pulling out of that slum, which would be a part of a market cycle, we were at the bottom. 2010 and 11, we started seeing it come back up. Well, if we've been sitting in an area where the average days on market for the entire Metroplex, or let's just say 48 days on market, and I'm looking at a heat map, and now all of a sudden I'm starting to see a pocket that's getting really low days on market. Maybe, like in this case, Bishop Arts, 2009, mm -hmm. 10, 11, Bishop Arts boomed. Well, maybe if I was looking at big data and I was able to start looking at a map and telling myself, this is where I should be putting my eggs, we could have been ahead of a Bishop Arts curve. Right. So with that heat map and being able to see where things are going, I'm going to start talking about strategies that can be implemented to take advantage of that moving path without putting yourself personally at risk of that moving path. So we've talked about taking like big data, mapping it through heat maps, taking an idea and seeing what's going on in those areas. 
let's apply some strategies to moving that forward. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't have a bank line of credit that says, you know what, go consume $15 million of real estate on the fringes of this, what we perceive to be a boom headed in this direction. How can I move into that area and consume real estate without consuming my credit and finances? Well, as Grant Kemp has taught on many occasions, we might be able to start applying all of our marketing efforts right into the fringes of those areas and try and find subject to properties. Properties that we can pitch, pick up subject to the existing mortgage, potentially correct some arrears, and now acquire a property without using our credit, without using potentially our capital. In this instance, if we're this particular model, not the model that Grant uses, Grant purchases property subject to and then sells them on a wrap. That is his primary investing model. What, we're, what we'll do in this area is we'll purchase them subject to and then hold them as a rental. So let's say on average, the sellers in these areas that are behind on, on, their, on their mortgage, which is often the leading indicator of somebody willing to do a subject to transaction, let's say it cost me $5,000 a door to correct the arrears, take ownership of the property and turn it into a rental. If I do that, and now over the next year, I am focusing just on those fringes at acquiring them, let's say I'm able to pick up 10 to 12 new properties that I own and control and are cash flowing as rentals in the fringe of that market. And let's say it takes two years for this economy over here to push into me, mm -hmm. but that economy pushes into me. Let's say I took it over for easy math. I took it over subject to the existing mortgage with an underlying debt at $100,000. That $100,000, though, experiences a 40% appreciation in the next two years because of the market that's next to in that market pushing into me. If I get a 40% appreciation on $100,000, that's 40 grand that I just made in appreciation through intelligent investing. Mm -hmm. And let's say I got 10 properties, once again, for easy math. I just accidentally made, accidentally made right. $400,000 as a flipper that would take you a considerable amount of money, but instead I've cash flowed on it. I don't have a whole lot of expended capital. Let's say on average I have to spend $5,000 a door. That's 50 grand. If I don't have 50 grand, I can partner up with a capital partner, pull that 50 grand down. I've just taken advantage of that. And one thing I do want to point out is, because you were talking about, you know, as a flipper, you're never going to make that. You know, there's certain, I don't want to say rules of thumb, and what I'm about to say, I'll, I'll preface by saying, Absolutely, there are uh, extreme examples where what I'm about to say is 100% incorrect. Um, in, as wholesaling, if you can make over $300,000 a year wholesaling, you are killing it in this game. As a flipper, yes, you can get to that 300 to a million dollars a year um, as a flipper, but to go over a million wholesaling and flipping, that's very, very rare. Um, obviously you could scale with sizes of teams, but if you were a solopreneur and you have a small team, take it from me. And again, I get there's people, there's ex plenty of examples out there there's where what about <laughs> Joe Schmo? I get it. Joe Schmo was killing it. But from, from the whole, right. you're not going to be able to make these leaps and bounds in your investing game without continually adding strategies like the sub two game, like accidentally uh, uh, jumping on an appreciation um, uh, zone like what we're talking about. Um, so I guess my little nugget there is to always be learning and always just in, try to try out new things and, and go to your city council meetings and try to do this. This is where I'm about to start dropping some massive nuggets from a business standpoint of real estate. I'm not talking about strategy right now. I'm talking mm -hmm. about business strategy. I'm not talking about rehabbing subject to wraps, shorts. Those are all investment strategies, I'm going to talk about the investment strategy, the overall big picture of how to apply these individual strategies to a much bigger strategy that will allow you to turn that $400,000 profit into a $2 million profit. And that's why you need to be sticking around. Uh, we're going to go to a quick break here in a second. Um, we're going to jump on some comments, some questions that we have already flooded in. Um, if you want to get your questions in live, Start asking them, start dropping them, both on YouTube, on the Facebooks, um, podcasts. Well, I don't know what, how, maybe, I don't know how they do questions on podcasts. Find the YouTube video, the Facebook video, and ask those questions. Uh, but stick around, we're gonna take a quick break, and we're gonna get back to uh, really, you Taking know, you to, from 400,000 to 2 million in the same you know, strategy. How, how about, we, we're gonna coin a new phrase. We're gonna 400X your business. <laughs> All right, stick around, we'll be right back. <laughs> Hey, welcome 
welcome back. <laughs> so, let's get into a couple questions and comments. Well, while you're scrolling through some questions, I'm going to recap on that. It's like, you go ahead. Well, like, if we're go ahead, if, or I'm, no. Stop, if, I if, if 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 I acquire these ten properties on the fringes of a path of improvement. And do, through no other strategy other than acquisition, I accumulated an extra $400,000 on my net worth, plus the cash flow that I've received from those properties. And I did that with inside of about a year, maybe two years, 400,000. What we're gonna talk about is how to turn that 400,000 into 2 million. And this is where I'm gonna transition into market cycles. Mm -hmm. What kind of questions do we have up until now though? Um, one of them from YouTube, and, and I don't know, you're much smarter than I am, but the question is from uh, A Baker 76 is what kind of incentives kickbacks typically are offered on regentrification capital incentives that if you're referring to the um the local government themselves, sometimes you'll get tax, I, I think abatement is the correct word, but whenever let's say I was looking at taking down that Craig Ranch um property, the city council was providing massive tax incentives to people that were willing to develop in those areas on a grand scale. They were talking to people like, you know, if you're coming in and you're going to apply $65 million into a development here, we'll take your taxes and we'll lock you in at a specific tax rate for 15 years. And we're talking about $100 million worth of property and property taxes are a million dollars annually. That's a big bill, and if I can skirt $10 million worth of taxes, those are, those are incentives. So I'm not a positive exactly what the question was or where it was pushing to, but the, the, your local governments might give you tax incentives. Mm -hmm. They might give you um, grants. You know, So like in certain areas of Dallas, they have HUD zoned areas. And if you come in and you build in those areas, a lot of the times the government will reimburse you up to 50% of the build costs for applying capital into these areas because the government knows that they want things to happen in this area and the government themselves doesn't have the capacity to uh, make that happen. Mm -hmm. So they look to the private sector to apply their funds into this area and then they give them incentives to do so through grants, through tax incentives, through many different other little things like that. And um, I'm not positive if I answered the question there, but I believe that's where they were trying to head. Uh, and, and forgive me if, it's, if it takes a second to find questions or comments, it's just there's a lot of them. Uh, but I just, just want to say shout out to Todd and, and Sonia and uh, Ace on YouTube for watching and, and here on Facebook. Ascension? I, I, you're better than I am. Um, you know, Miranda, uh, Sohail, Sarah, Jason Witherspoon, Mark, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you so much for watching. I did see a comment earlier about uh, making your own market. Okay. You know, that's a great point because uh, I know uh, investors locally like uh, uh, Yale, he goes in and he focuses in on his own neighborhood mm -hmm. to where if, if, you know, he can, this house over here can help appreciate this house. And then, you know, I think it's a little bit different what we're talking about, but not really. Um, no, it's, it's just you're forcing growing, your own market. You're forcing I did that over in Grand Prairie. I purchased my very first property on this specific street. It was East Coral Way. On East Coral Way, I purchased it and I expected my ARV to be about ninety thousand on the property, and I picked it up for about thirty. Um, I then bought the house next door to it, and whenever I sold my first property, it sold for about a hundred thousand, so about ten thousand more than I anticipated. But then I bought the house next door to it, exact property, exact mm -hmm. exact everything. It sold for 110, and then I bought the one behind it, literally. I bought five houses on this one city block, and by the time was everything was said and done with and I started selling them off, the final sale hit about $130,000 because I was taking my existing properties and comping, using them as my own comps. So through the course of about six months, I added about $40,000 worth of market value to that one city block. And, and uh, side note on there, side tip, um, say you're in an area and you're, you're a wholesaler, and you have a house that's completely run down and there's really not a market for wholesalers or, or investors in that market. But say there are one or two construction. Uh, hopefully you get what I'm bringing up here. Maybe there's one or two houses on the street that are new construction and they just happen to be built by the same investor construction guy. Um, you're better off selling that house to that guy than anybody else because he has he or she has uh, incentive to get more acquisitions in that neighborhood because They're one or two flips is really not going to drive uh, drive anything. But the more and more flips you can get in the neighborhood, that's gonna drive that gentrification, drive that, that, uh, that little appreciation. Market. Yeah. So 
I don't know if we have more questions over here, but what I'm gonna go ahead and move towards is how do I turn that $400,000 that I picked up by selecting where I was going to focus my marketing, where am I gonna turn that 400,000 into 2 million? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. And then I'm gonna talk about how we use market cycles to aid into our investment strategies. So we've pinpointed an area of town where we're able to see an expansion of value through gentrification. How do I take advantage of that? We've already discussed. Let's start going into the outskirts and start taking down some subject to properties to purchase and hold as rentals. I've held them for the year to two. I've seen the appreciation push in. And now I'm starting to see new construction occur within my area. I'm starting to see massive remodels occurring in my area where that wasn't happening two years prior. On nothing other than just appreciation alone, I was able to pull, pull 400,000. How do I turn that 400,000 into 2 million? Mm -hmm. This is where we're gonna start talking about market cycles and how to apply specific strategies in specific cycles to aid and accelerate your investing growth at a, at a, at a multiplier that most will not understand. And, and, and real quick, just because I know everybody watching has watched every single episode we've ever done on, on Propelio TV, all of them. Um, and, and the reason I bring that up is we frequently have said time and time again, you should never be investing and buying in houses solely based off of the appreciation speculative play. Um, it sounds like that is exactly the opposite of what we're about to talk about. Yes but and no. Yes and no. You should no. still be buying just in case. No. For the, for no. the lower side. No. Every single property that I acquired on the front side, cash flows as a rental. It is a deal at that moment in time. It is a deal at that moment in well, that's time. That's what I'm bringing up. Yeah. yeah. So I'm not, I'm not purchasing strictly on appreciation. I am taking data to tell me how I'm going to capitalize on the market cycles. We have upward trending cycles. We have flat cycles. We have downward trending cycles. We are on a flat cycle in that neighborhood. That neighborhood has sat stagnant at $100,000 value for many years. But whenever I come in and I acquire into that neighborhood, I'm acquiring subject to existing financing. I'm not using my own capital or credit, but it is cash flowing as a rental. Mm -hmm. And with it cash flowing as a rental, it is still a sound investment. I am not really coming out of pocket. I should have a, a defined ROI on my, on my, on my uh, arrears that I uh, corrected. And I am hoping for appreciation, but I have a solid investment up front. And, that, and that's why I wanted to just bring that up very quickly is even though we're talking a lot about speculation and the, the appreciation play and that 400X, whatever, mm -hmm. it's still a sound investment day one. It is still a sound investment day one. And what I'm about to teach you is how to use cycles to create your own inventory of just little printing presses of, of money. We're in a low cycle, acquired 10 properties, saw 40% appreciation just through the market itself because we bought in a flat market. It went into an upward trending market because that gentrification is pushed over into my side of town. As that occurs, the reason it went up 40% is because demand in that area has gone up and we're starting to see people flip property. We're starting to see people build property. Well, in the flat market or on the low end of a market where, where that's where it sat flat for years and I'm buying in, it's because I'm anticipating that spike, but it's still a good investment here. I am in the trough of a cycle. I'm at the bottom of a cycle that I'm, I'm speculating on. Well, when I'm at the bottom of the cycle, when you are at the bottom of a cycle, you should be acquiring massive amounts of rentals. You should be doing everything you can on the bottom of a cycle to buy as many rentals as you possibly can, whether that's through subject two, through shorts, through your Burr method, acquire as many properties on the bottom of that cycle as you possibly can. We mentioned subject mm -hmm. two, but outside of that, if you have acquired bank financing, you're able to focus in on that, acquire whatever you can acquire, however you can, shorts, sub two, and rents or mm -hmm. Burr. Buy up as much as you possibly can, as long as it makes sense as a deal that day. But as the market starts going up, the reason it's going up is because if we're looking at this from a gentrification standpoint, it's because people have created a, a demand for that market that was not there when I bought into it. Uh, home values have gone up. I'm starting to see rehabbers come in. The rehabbers that come in at that point in time 
were late to the game. Those are the people that are watching HGTV and they're not thinking about this from a business standpoint. Mm -hmm. Those people are late to the game. I bought in two years early. I not only collected 40% of appreciation going into there, but as a smart investor, I also purchased my inventory for my rehabs. And I bought my rehab inventory two years before the market hit. So if I'm seeing a market cycle and I'm seeing this just crash, like if, if mm -hmm. I see a new 2008, 2009 again, and I'm just watching this market burn and die, as that thing is dropping, shorts subject to, as I start seeing it hit close to the bottom. And then once it hits to the bottom, burr sub to short the whole time and acquire as many properties as I possibly can because what's gonna happen whenever it starts going up? I'm gonna get the appreciation from the bottom, but then I've also acquired my, my inventory for remodels. So as it's going back up, and I see all the people that are late to the game trying yeah. to buy into my neighborhood so that they can remodel and sell off, I've already acquired my inventory when it was 40% cheaper. I've got these 10 properties, and let's say that they're now worth $140,000 as they sit with no remodels done to it, but let's say the ARV now on them, the after repaired value on them is 250 grand. And let's say just for easy math, I have to put $30,000 into each one of these. They're now worth 100, now I've got 170,000 in basis into each one of these properties, and I've got $80,000 in profit times 10 properties. That's now $800,000 in cap gains. I went from $40,000 in cap gains to 800,000 in cap gains, but there's another caveat that I can apply to that is I have a tax benefit here. I've held these properties for longer than a year, so I'm no longer paying short-term cap gains. I'm paying long-term cap gains on all these properties. And so now my tax, my tax liabilities on these properties are significantly lower, increasing my value. But I only got that to 800,000. I'm trying to get this thing to 2 million. Mm -hmm. Let's take a look at your neighborhood. What's happening to these homes? Are they being remodeled or are they being bulldozed? They're bulldozed. They are bulldozing these houses. Well, I might look at this neighborhood and if it doesn't hit the area of maybe we're gonna bulldoze it, could I risk creating that market? Mm -hmm. I already control an inventory in this market. Could I be the leading factor to this? Can I now create my own market? Can I say speculatively, maybe I'll bulldoze this, build a duplex, sell one half for 600,000, the other half for 600,000? Or could I build one half and sell it for, for 350,000 and the other half for 350,000? Could that then take my profit from 80,000 to 160,000? Mm -hmm. 160,000 times 10 properties, $1.6 million in profit. And, and, and it wouldn't be 160 times 10 because well, as I, I should might be able to. you should be able to incrementally increase. Because I'm... Yeah, yeah, because you're, you're driving your own market. You're, you're forcing that appreciation. So this is where I'm starting to talk about using a long-term strategy across multiple different in uh, investing, um, man, I keep, I say investing strategy. What, what's another word that I can use for a short or a sub two or a rehab? That's an investing uh, template <laughs> tool. <laughs> tool. I mean, I mean, I can't really weapon. Yeah. Um, uh, it's a strategy, uh, yeah. but I, I don't really know. Hey, if you but, can help us out in the comments. Yeah. <laughs> let's take a look at that. I, I will, there, I will say, you know, uh, what, Daniel just went on and, and, and hopefully I did a good job by not interrupting you. That's a lot of meat. And, and I, can, uh, I can imagine people having to rewind two or three times just to catch up all what you just said. What I just did is I taught a wholesaler how to become a millionaire. Right. And, Very and, fast. Yeah. And then so I highly recommend you kind of paper note where paper note, whatever, <laughs> um, you know, the timestamp and re go back and listen to all that. Um, because one thing in that example, um, if you look at a lot of the successful real estate investors in the game right now, I would, I don't want to bet, but I would, you, you could almost say that they got in right at 08, 08, 09, 10, and they already had a piggy bank. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's and, and I'm not trying to take away from anybody's success in this game, but let's say you had a piggy bank and you jumped into the real estate investing game in 08, 09, when everybody else had been wiped out. That was like. It. 
Yeah, what I'm saying is like you had successful investors who had multiple crews, had multiple houses, uh, 07, 08, and they were just like printing money, making it rain, had rap trucks galore. <laughs> and then the banks are like, oh, by the way, those 70 notes that you're making on time payments to, um, we want we want our money back because all these other a-holes in Florida can't afford their short mortgage, we're well, not shorts, uh, uh, subprimes. Right. Um, so I need you to cover that. And so, so wipe them all out. And the point being is if you had money, going back, tying it back in what you just said, at the bottom of the market cycle, if you had a piggy bank. Pac-Man. Just, you just, yeah, exactly. Just consume. Just, just eat it all up. And then once it rises up and all, the, like you said, the HGTV guys coming on board. Hey, by the way, here, take this house. Go for it. Do whatever you want. So, so let's rewind that back to a previous episode that we did with Mark Harisco. Uh, he spoke on that specifically, like he had a massive amount of properties on notes that he was paying on time, on on every single note payment paid. The the crash hit and his bank's calling him, but he's like, hey, I know you've been really good to us, but I want all of that money back because we're, we're struggling here and I want that money back. And it was very interesting. If you want to rewind, I'm not going to discuss this, but he discussed how he took it that mm. and how he got his legal involved and basically told the banks, nah, I know that you have the right to do that, but I'm going to make it so hard for you to do that that it's not going to be worth your time. And he defended himself from that. So I'm not I'm not going to discuss that at all. But if you want to watch it, yeah, Mark Risco we'll was a guest on here. Yeah, just, uh, just watch that. Google it or um, You know, we do have a couple of uh, people helping us out here. We got tool, instrument, techniques, exit strategy. Um, you know, those are... Those are some of what we were trying to come Technique up with. might be a good one we yeah. could use. Uh, so an investing technique, which would be, I guess, rehabbing. I like calling them strategies, but we're, we're blending words there. Um, Semantics. We'll, we'll call it the investment plan and the investment strategy. Right? They're the same damn thing, so who cares? We're, I'm re I'm we're gonna call it do what Daniel says or else. <laughs> Let, let's just roll back to it and just real fast recap. Saw the, saw the market moving in a specific direction, preemptively bought in through short sub two and burr, uh, held onto that property for the, the appreciation wave. I've moved through this appreciation wave and I've created myself an inventory of remodels. Uh, I could also be daring and or catch the trend and start becoming a new construction developer in this market. But what I did is when the market hit the bottom, I consumed as much inventory as I possibly could. I held that inventory until the appreciation hit, and then I rolled that inventory off. And here are some things that we can look at on the upside of this market. As this market is moving up, what do I want to do? I could rehab, sell off, take those cap gains, and roll them back into my existing portfolio of properties that I'm, uh, that I'm liking, and pay those mortgages down in preparation for the next dip. I could take and call my inventory essentially, you know, take a look at all of my inventory, say which properties in my inventory do I want to hold through another cycle? Because you don't want to sell your inventory off at the bottom of the cycle, you want to sell your inventory off at the top of the cycle. So I need to look at the cycle and, where and I'm at. And if that doesn't make sense to you, that's fine. Just rewind. Just start at Propelio TV number one and rewatch. Am I going to... No, no, I'm just saying because yeah. it, it's just, when we fly through things like that, it, it's like, it seems obvious. Sell high, buy low. Buy low, sell high. So when we're talking about bottom of the market cycle, buy low. Sell at the top of the market cycle, buy or sell high. And so many and people do that the opposite way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, that, that goes against anything, any kind of product, stocks, trades, anything. But I just want to emphasize because again, you do have a tendency to talk really fast. If somebody wants to get to the next level of investing where it's like you are booming and not just you know doing good, mm -hmm. if you want to boom, you don't buy your inventory at the top of the market cycle. You buy your inventory at the bottom of the market cycle. And this is an eight year plan. This is an eight year strategy. Um, but as I buy at the bottom and I'm starting to see everything move to the top, as I see it moving to the top, and this is where I need to start rehabbing, and this is where rehabbers should really be playing ball. As I'm moving into the top, re rehabbing and wholesaling. Wholesaling mm -hmm. works in any strategy, but there's definitely market cycles where you have a higher chance of really pushing wholesaling but off. But let's get into the wholesaling side because going back to you know fish for, for people who aren't fishing and that forced appreciation, say you do have a neighborhood that's not really appreciating like crazy, but you do know that their investor Smith on the side over here is making an effort to push it. If you have that insider knowledge that, you know, I mean, John Smith, the investor over here, is trying to do that, and you're the only one that's focusing your efforts in that area, your wholesale fees should be pretty high. 
That being said, if you're marketing in areas that everybody's attacking, like all the wholesalers are attacking, you know, your wholesaler fees are going to go low just be based off of competition. All strategies work, all cycles. Find your niche, like you were just saying. Yeah. Find an area where other people aren't focused. Focus in on that and your opportunities will rise. Mm -hmm. Everybody talks about how competitive it is right now and there is a considerable amount of competition out That's there. Fine. But if you find a niche and you focus on that like um, uh, Royce, Royce is just focusing on nothing other than infill lots. He is going out and acquiring infill lots at massive, mm -hmm. at massive rates because he found a niche that no one else was targeting and he's just dominating on it. Strategies work in all cycles. You got to figure out what's going on there, but certain strategies work better in certain cycles. And that's where I'm getting to. And yeah. that's when I'm on an upward trending cycle, I don't want to buy my rentals at the top of the market because I'm going to become the next short. I'm going to become the next sub two. I'm going to become the next person that goes bankrupt in this business. Yeah. I buy my inventory at the bottom. I offload at the top. I capitalize through rehabbing and new construction as I'm going up. And then once I hit the top, I call off any inventory that I don't plan on holding through a whole nother cycle. I capitalize and then I start kind of moving into a holding pattern of where I sit still and I'm waiting for it to pop and drop. And so basically, you're, I mean, it's a risk tolerance thing is, is you're, as you go up, you're offloading anything that could be too much risk mm -hmm. and everything that's in your piggy bank is something that you want to be there versus the whole, the whole I, don't, I don't really see it that much anymore, but the, the strategy used to be, you know, wholesale it. If it doesn't wholesale, ah, you keep those as rentals, which is not the strategy <laughs> to do. You only keep it as a rental if it makes sense to keep it as a rental. Right. Um, so, you know, wholesale everything unless it, it doesn't, if it doesn't sell, if it keeps it as a rental, don't do that. Um, let's take another break. Then we come back, we'll, we'll hit up all the last comments, all the questions, uh, getting the final points you have. Um, and then, you know, talk about what we do. Uh, real quick, before we go to break, just want to talk about Propelio.com, what we do, why we're doing this. Uh, uh, actually, you're better at this, so why don't you pitch us Propelio.com and why people yeah. need to, to get into it real quick. So Propelio.com is a tool for uh, an, an investor that's anywhere from new to advanced that is seeking new leads. Uh, we produce lead lists that are built in-house here, and we do this all by hand. And so the lead list that we provide are refreshed every 24 hours by hand. And to the best of my knowledge, they are some of the freshest lead lists available. And I don't, I can't, I can't definitively say that, but we invest a considerable amount of time into our lead list. And that's why so many people say that our lead lists have gotten them considerable amount of deals. Beyond that, we have the ability to generate leads for you through uh, websites. If you do not have a website for your business, if you're still using a Gmail email or a Yahoo email or something like that and you want to build you know you want to or at aol.com i mean if you're wanting to to add a little extra layer of branding to your business and you need a website to start driving traffic to if you're doing direct mail or if you're doing craigslist ads or you're doing online classified marketing and you want to capture these leads and bring them back to your website if you're just going on acquisition appointments and you want to build a layer of credibility to your business propelio.com can have you a website in about 45 seconds like i go in there and say you know what we buy House is fast and 48 hours.com purchase that domain and immediately and in just a matter of minutes with limited to zero knowledge about how to build a website have a website for your business to add yourself a layer of credibility you take it another step further from there if you're looking at analysis we can do MLS comps on this side where you come in there you type in an address immediately have the data available in front of you to go out and make an educated decision on things if you're trying to acquire properties off of the MLS and you're searching all over the place and you're trying you know spending hours and hours a day trying to find discounted properties, Propelio gives you the ability to go in and search the MLS like an investor by using terms like, show me all properties that are at least 40% off of retail. And we'll run an algorithm against all active properties and start showing you the properties that have significant amounts of damage to them, that have problems, that are investor-friendly properties. So I'm not looking at thousands and thousands of properties to find the ones that make sense. Mm -hmm. So, so Propelio.com, seven day free trial, no credit card needed. Check it out. Be there, be square. I don't know. Um, Trey, take us to a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to wrap this episode up. So get those questions in, get those comments in, and we'll be right back.
All right, welcome back. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, um, hopefully, there's been a lot of nuggets, a lot of value to this episode. Highly recommend replaying and uh, rewatching this episode maybe a couple of times, um, just because you know Daniel does just bah, 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 drop knowledge, drop those bombs. So, uh, Daniel, real quick, can you please recap the market cycles and and kind of uh, any final points you wanted to drop in there? Ultimately, if you're wanting to stop accidentally making money and taking advantage of where people are making six figures plus accidentally and, and learning and, and how to, to do that. And to be fair, if you can accidentally make money, you're doing an awesome job. But if you <laughs> want to survive, you got to learn how to do that scientifically. Right. And through doing that, we need to see what gentrification is and understand the market cycle on a macro and micro level start studying my local economics, find out where the areas of gentrification, gentrification are occurring, try and push right onto the outskirts of them and or within them if you have the ability to do so. Move into those areas and or to the outskirts of them if you can considerably see a, a leading indicator that it's gonna move that direction. Acquire properties that make sense that day through strategies like shorts, sub two and burr. Move through, hold those until the appreciation wave has hit use that as an inventory of remodels, remodel them or rebuild them, and then turn around and sell them off to capitalize at the top of the market, and then hold in a capital position as the market starts falling again. And these are eight year strategies to 10 year strategies. But if I do that, and I do that very consistently, you will become a lifelong real estate investor and not just a, a cyclical real estate investor, and you will turn yourself not only into a wealthy person, but a generational wealthy person, because it will take you from, you know, making good money to making generational wealth through real estate. And the strategy that I just explained to you, while it might not, you know, seem as powerful through this conversation, if you study what I'm talking about and you learn how to take advantage of that, you will become a generationally wealthy person. Mm -hmm. And, and on that, it, it, if you're in real estate, it should be the goal of generational. Oh, clearly, everybody wants to be rich as hell and provide for their families forever and ever and ever. But real estate has that 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 uh, uh, the history. It has the 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 the, uh, the scorecard. I don't know what I'm, I'm trying to say. It has the history. Historically, of, historically, people in, that do real estate investing, you know, that are successful in it, you know, their kids and their kids' kids, their generations are well taken care of. So if you came from the bottom and you want to change the trajectory of your family forever, real estate has historically been a great vehicle for doing that because mm -hmm. historically outside of here in the recent 10 years where technology has taken that over, real estate was the number one generator of millionaires in the United States. Or I can't speak beyond that. And I've heard that statistic from enough places. I feel like that is a strong fact. Yeah. Real estate has historically been the number one path to millions in, in, in pretty much America that I can speak on. Yeah, I mean, and there's so many examples there. Um, so if you if you like the episode, if you if you got value, please let us know in the comments section. Um, if you're watching this on a podcast uh, or listening on a podcast, please drop us a review, rate it, subscribe it, all, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I know we got a couple of questions. I know Ace had a question earlier, um, and I, I wanted to wait till we got to the end just because I wanted to keep you on uh, point because you were dropping bombs there. Um, when we were talking about the city council and, and those type of things, what paperwork is needed to get the grants uh, to build in lower income neighborhoods? Um, before you start, I will say this, grant writing and grants in general is an entirely huge industry on its own. Mm -hmm. There are people that make a living solely by writing grants. Yep. So there's really nothing we can say in 30 seconds to answer that question, but I'll, I'll throw it to you anyway. What I'm going to go ahead and say is I would talk to the city council, ask them what programs they have available. And then once I know what programs they have available, I'd say, what resource do you have from within that can give me access to that paperwork? So they're going to be like, well, call XXY at zoning and committee or mm -hmm. whatever. And then once you get a hold of that paperwork beyond that, it's just going to be read, consume, and then potentially get legal guidance on it. Because like we were looking at a property out mm -hmm. in Amarillo that had significant incentives for uh, restoring that property and the paperwork for that was you know a, a stack of XYZ paperwork it was not just like a little one page fill in the blanks type of thing it was 70 80 90 pages of documentation and forms that had to be filled out to acquire that grant so yeah. you need to really just 
uh, A, network, B, ask as many questions when you're there as you possibly can, and then C, bring in potential legal guidance. Yeah, on that, what I would throw in also is, is in my limited experience with that, is typically when you're dealing with the cities, most of them seem, again, limited experience, they seem like they genuinely want to help you, but at the same time, when, by you helping them, you need to be helping them in the sense that you're trying to not give them any more work. Right. So if you can get that initial and just be very honest and be like, look, we want to, we want to do right by you and your city, and I will also want to make it to where it's as easy as possible for you, but uh, the, the biggest thing there is is get a professional that knows what they're doing on grant writing on your corner. Um, that being said, I think everybody, not everybody, but there, it seems like there's a lot of people like, yeah, I have grant experience. It's like maybe do a little bit more research than what you would typically do for, hey, a roofer. Hey, you know, Daniel said this roofer is good. Let's go. I, I would hold when it comes to grant writing because grant writing is a whole other beast. Um, he, uh, Ace had another uh, second question. He's like, how do you convince the city council that you want to acquire vacant lots in income uh, or lower income neighborhoods? I'm not really seeing there needing to be any convincing there. The city council is not going to allow you or anything of that nature. They have no control over what you do there. But if you're networking at the city council and you start developing friends, they might those friends might be able to give you points and indicators as to areas that you may want to focus on because maybe, A, they know of things that are going to be happening in that area. And they're like, well, if you're looking to focus on lower income areas, some of the things that I might want to let you know is that Diamond Hill, we're planning on putting some more money into. So if you're looking to revitalize an area you might want to look at diamond hill versus eastwood echo heights stop six you know mm -hmm. there there might be some different things that they can point you into different directions on but convincing them that that's what you want to do i don't really i don't really know if i'm answering the question because i don't really see right. it there but i don't think city council is somebody you need to convince at, at the end of the day it's, it's it's the city you need to make friends in your local uh local city government whether that be at the, the city planner's office, whether that be at the code enforcement office, the city council meetings. Uh, I, I can't remember who, whose tip it was, but somebody said every every Monday or every once every other week, bring a box of donuts to the, the code enforcement office. Uh, but mainly make friends with your local city government. Um, what comes of it, who knows? Network means network, a lot. Network means everything. Um, Courtney uh, has a good question, um, and I met Courtney this weekend over at the Roughneck to Real Estate event. Um, good is job, Courtney. Is she Corey. from Louisiana? She is. I think I've talked to her more yeah. than once. Hey, Daniel, uh, you were talking about buying sub two and with short sales during a down cycle. Any suggestions for how to buy right or how to buy right during the top, where we are right now in many markets? Sub two owner finance at a deep count discount. Any other thoughts? So. Every investment strategy will work in every cycle. It's just the the prolific amount of that strategy that can be employed. Sub two and shorts on a down market are absolutely just hand over fist, consume as much as you can. But on, on the top side of a market, it's hard to find shorts because it's moved up. So the, act, the specific acquisition model uh, is indifferent on the top side of the market, but you do need to be a a very picky buyer. You don't want to be a motivated buyer that says, you know what, I have to do 100 deals this year, so I'm going to buy 100 properties, whether or not they'll hold out through another eight year cycle or not. So you're going to acquire less on the top side. You don't want to be buying in significant amounts on the top side. So strategies that I would employ on the top side is when you get motivated buyers entering the market, which creates that bit of a bubble, transition more into wholesaling because you're no longer consuming the risk and then cherry picking the properties that make the best sense for holding through a down market and or for a current remodel at this current market. That is what I'd be doing. Wholesaling and cherry picking off the properties that I want. And then I'd move that one step further and I would say, excuse me, I'm hyperventilating like none other here. Um, Wholesaling, cherry picking off the properties that I'm wanting at the top side of the market. And then once I move past that acquisition model, I'm, lo I'm losing myself here, but overall- We're talking about real estate. Yeah, but overall, <laughs> I am looking to not be a motivated buyer on the top side. Right. I am going to cherry pick what I want, wholesale everything else off. I don't like buying more than 70 cents on the dollar. 
I'm not going to be motivated and start buying at 85 cents on the dollar. But if the market is buying at 85 cents on the dollar, then that's an opportunity for me to wholesale because I can get it at 75 cents, sell it at 85 cents and not put myself in a risky position. And I finally remembered the second half to what I remember, what I was wanting to say. And that was what Dan Cito said or what John Lau said or what some like Royce Colley has been doing. And that is find a niche that has less competition in it. If single family is booming, single family market cycles, commercial market cycles, retail commercial, multifamily commercial, office industrial warehouse commercial, uh, mobile homes, they all have different cycles. Each and every specific city has its own market cycle. Every sub market within that city has a market cycle. Find markets that have leading indicators of being at the bottom of its market. Like we've talked about Fair Park for a long time. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody wanted to buy Fair Park, but everybody was buying Bishop Arts. Well, if everybody's buying Bishop Arts, don't be the next person that's trying to buy Bishop Arts. Be the person that's trying to find how to fish where no one else is fishing. No, Fair Park's not booming right now. No, Diamond Hill is not booming right now. But if I can see clear indications that it's going to head that way, and I can start acquiring where nobody else is really wanting to, and I can do that still at the discounts that I'm okay with at 70 cents on the dollar, I will then hold that inventory for long-term appreciation or long-term uh, inventory for my remodels. And, and on that, it doesn't have to be rocket science. I, I think a lot of the stuff we talked about today was very systematic and very, very clinical in the sense of go to your city council, research, uh, find the indicators, find the path, research freeways, research that. But sometimes it is simple as looking at a map and just looking at it and going, well, obviously this over here, area over here, should be a booming area. Case in point, area where I live, uh, I live with a buddy of mine, lived with him way too long, but whatever, he's my best friend. He bought where we live for $150,000. He bought next door for $180,000. These are 3,000 square foot, four bedroom, three and a half bath townhomes. Um, and they were built in 07, then the market crash, and they were basically, basically builder foreclosures. But if you look on a map, we are one exit north of downtown. It only makes sense that over time, that neighborhood would gentrify and be a quality neighborhood for downtown. And, 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 and so my point there is, a deal is a deal wherever you can get it, but sometimes it doesn't have to be rocket science. You could very well be first. But I want to rewind that back and move away from the accidental side. Now, yes, there is clear. Well, it wasn't accidental. It was planned, but it was. What I'm leading to, though, is there are clear indications that that's going to happen. I, I totally yeah. agree with you. But if you, be, if you get more scientific with it. Absolutely. It will be, because like right now, if we've done that, Fair Park is the exact same thing. It is like one exit away from downtown, but Fair Park is for the last 35, 40 years has been bad. I did say I got held at gunpoint. Yeah. So, I mean, it could have been a horrible risk. If I can see the indicators that say it's 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 turning, Yeah. like the Sam's Club was going to be a, a multi-use, high-end, West yeah. End style complex, that's the indicator that this is about to boom. And if I buy in and I get in right then and there, instead of it potentially, in this case, this didn't happen, but instead of it potentially being a 15 year hold where I've gone through two cycles with my money tied into this investment, I could make it two years where I'm tied into this investment, turn my capital faster, and then take that capital that I've turned and apply it to another area. Yeah. It's by no means am I trying to discount what you have just said. Oh, yeah. But if we were wanting to push this past accidental, I need the data to prove to me that this is about to happen. Yeah, an interesting factoid that has nothing to do with no relevance to the episode, but just because I think it's interesting, instead of looking as an as a investment property now, it's like, where else am I going to get 6,000 square feet of property this close to downtown? So instead of selling off in the future, he's like, well, sh hell, I'll just make it a giant mansion with an <laughs> elevator. Right. So, you know, why, why would I ever move out? <laughs> Screw that. But anyway, I just want to say thank you so much to everybody watching. I know we had a lot of people giving us a lot of love on the Facebook and, and on YouTube. Uh, but if you're watching this on a replay, let us know. We want to know where you're, where you're watching from, um, what you learn, what you have questions. We monitor Facebook. We monitor YouTube in the comment section and, and, and do our best to answer any and all questions. So, uh, make sure you drop those questions. Make sure uh, you engage with us and let us know how we could better help you. Um, any final thoughts before we, we uh, uh, tune out for the day? 
I would just really like for the people that have stuck, stuck with us for this past hour and consumed this knowledge, as you've started trying to apply this, which I strongly suggest you do, there wasn't much of a point in you watching this for the last hour if you're not going to apply this. Yeah, as action. you start applying this and taking action, come back and say, hey, man, I've done this, and I didn't realize that this was about to happen. I used Batch Geo, and I exported property data, and I applied it to Batch Geo, and I started realizing that, wow, this area is about to see this, or I went and attended the city council meeting, or I went to planning and zoning. Tell us in the comments what's happened because we spend a considerable amount of time up here trying to create content to not only help you, but to help you and your family grow. Mm -hmm. Come back and tell us how this is turning out for you because we, we're, we're truly interested in finding out. You know, everybody loves positive feedback, but you know, interesting factoid about us, we, our team, we do use Slack, which if you're not familiar with Slack, it's just a internal business messaging system. And every time we see a, a attaboy type of comment, you know, somebody on the team screenshots it and throws it in our, our awesome uh, channel. Um, and it, we love that. And I know everybody loves to be told that it they're doing good. It reminds us why we're but, doing this. But it, 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 yeah, it reinforces that why of ours. Um, and if you, I sent out an email late last night about, uh, you know, subscribing to Propelio and, and was able to drop some, some comments in there of, of hey, y'all are doing a great job. And so we genuinely love to, to get that feedback. So if we're changing your life, we're helping us out, please let us know um, just because it makes us feel good. <laughs> yeah. but anyway, um, check out Propelli.com, seven day free trial, um, no credit card needed. And if we're not in your market yet, please, please, please hit me up, Ryan at Propelli.com. And uh, the way we expand into your market is we partner with a local real estate broker and uh, uh, you know I can get into that one-on-one -on -one with them. But if you have an investor-friendly broker in your market, or if you in fact yourself are an investor-friendly market uh, a broker, I want to talk to you and uh, we, Propelio, want to be in your market. So hit me up and uh, have a great week. We're, we're, we're looking forward to being back and we'll see you tomorrow at 11. Anything else? No, nah, just much love to everybody that's taking the time to watch this and thank you for being there. Yeah, and then if this is your first time, make sure you subscribe, whether it be Facebook, YouTube, podcast, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, Tell Twitter. Um, what, MySpace? No, no, we're not on MySpace. <laughs> anyway, Trey, take us out. We'll see you tomorrow.